crime and the little gray cells. These will always catch the criminal. Agatha Christie's Poirot. From the thrill-packed pages of Agatha Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and magnificent mustache, your favorite detective, Hercule Poirot. Starring Harold Huber in The Deadest Man in the World. Mr. Poirot. Oh, thank heaven you're in. I was afraid to... Please, please close the door quickly. That's better. Thank you. He may have followed me. If he knows that I came to you... Mademoiselle, I... you have the advantage of me. You know my name. I do not know yours. But no matter. You seem to be in trouble. I have found that a cup of tea is... Oh, no, no. I mustn't stay. We haven't time. Uh, Mademoiselle... Uh... Shepherd. Shepherd. Mademoiselle Shepherd, what you have said is intriguing, but confusing. If you want my help... I'm sorry. I haven't made anything clear, have I? You see, Derek killed my daughter. Uh, Mademoiselle... Are you asking me to investigate the death of a dog? Oh, no, no, you don't understand. I know I'm telling this badly, but... Ah, perhaps it is my fault, mademoiselle, for being impatient and hastening to conclusions, eh? <laughs> you see, I live at Manhattan. You've probably never heard of it. A small suburb of New York, about 37 minutes by train from the Long Island Station. Oh, you know it, then? No, no, a small hobby of mine. I, I read timetables. Oh, well, I live there with my Uncle James. Pardon, mademoiselle. But if my memory does not betray me, James Shepard is a famous name. Is he not called... The luckiest man in the world. Yes, that's Uncle James. Uh, I have often asked myself if the newspapers were not wrong to call him lucky. I myself would have them change it to the shrewdest man in the world. What makes you say that? A simple deduction. Any man who wins the grand prize in the Dublin sweepstakes 40 years ago takes all his winnings and boldly breaks the bank at Monte Carlo and then, mademoiselle, and then has never gambled since... Ah, there is a man who makes good use of his little gray cell. I suppose some people might look at it that way, but others say that Uncle James is, is tight. Well, no matter. Uh, was it your uncle who sent you to see me? Is he also concerned about the death of this dog? Oh, no. Uncle James mustn't know anything about this. He's very ill, his, his heart. If he found out what was hanging over me, I, I'm afraid it would kill him. I see. Everything was all right until about a year ago. Uncle James was raising his rose, and we were all very happy, and then Derek Redfield took the house next to ours. He was, well, he was young and attractive, and... and... you are also young and attractive, and so you fell in love. Eh <laughs> bien, that is only natural, mademoiselle. Yes, but what happened next isn't. Derek is, oh, he's charming, Mr. Poirot, but he was insanely jealous. I noticed it before we became engaged, but he was just difficult then. After we became engaged, well... It was impossible. So you broke the engagement and returned his ring. How did you know? Mademoiselle, that is obvious. You tell me you are in difficulty. You tell me you were engaged. And yet I see no ring on your hand. Voila, you have given it back. You're right, but that's what started all this. Derek, Derek is going to kill me. Oh, come now, Mademoiselle, you are not serious. I was never more serious in my life. Ah, Mademoiselle, if we were to suspect every young man who threatened to kill his loved one when the affairs of the heart went badly, poof! Half the population would be in jail. And what about the dog? What about Taffy? He said he'd kill Taffy, and he did. But, mademoiselle, what makes you so certain your dog was killed? This. I knew you wouldn't believe me, so I brought it along. This is the meat, or part of it, that poor Taffy found in the garden last night. He ate it and died. It's horrible. Just smell it, Mr. Poirot. <sighs> yes. Yes, it is unmistakably poison. I confess this puts a different aspect on the affair. Then you will come down to Manhattan and help me. No, mademoiselle. But why not? Surely you believe me. He told me he'd kill Taffy as a warning. He knew I loved Taffy with all my heart and he poisoned him. I'm frightened, Mr. Poirot. You must protect me. Mademoiselle, I am not a, uh, how do you say, a, a guard for the body. Oh, but you must, I tell you, you must. Could you not go away for a little while? Oh, no use. He'd follow me. Anyway, I can't leave Uncle James. Oh, Mr. Poirot. Have you spoken to the police about this? No, no, they wouldn't help me. I was depending on you. I thought you'd do something. <laughs> Seems funny that somebody can be killed. Somebody can know she's going to be killed. Nobody will help her. <laughs> Doesn't that seem funny to you, Mr. Poirot? <laughs> Excuse me, mademoiselle. I had to do that. 
Hysteria uh, is not only unpleasant, but it also accomplishes nothing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Would you mind raising the shade? I'd feel better if there were a little more light. Not at all. Voila. Better? Uh, much. Thank you. Uh, perhaps a cigarette. I myself find they have a singularly soothing... Pardon. Hello, hello? Mr. Hercule Poirot? Speaking. This is a warning. If you know what's good for you, stay away from Elaine Shepard. Who is this? Mademoiselle, Hercule Poirot has changed his mind. You may expect me at Manhattan this evening. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poirot. No thanks, mademoiselle. I do not like people who kill dogs. And above all, I do not like to be threatened. Not a soul. I left the house the back way. You know no one ever comes here. Oh, Derek, why couldn't you come back with me on the train? Are you crazy? We mustn't be seen together now. That'd ruin everything. Just when we have it all in our grasp. All right, darling. You know best. Everything went just as you said it would. I was afraid you wouldn't see him pull up the shade. I knew he might prove difficult, but I was positive that phone call would get him. <laughs> the clever, clever Monsieur Perot. He'll be here this evening. Sure, just the way I figured it. The servants will be out tonight. And the luckiest man in the world will soon be the deadest man in the world. And we'll have the money. What about Anne? Well, he probably got her a few thousand, but what's the difference to us? We can afford to be generous. There's millions there. But Anne's his adopted daughter. He's terribly fond of her. Yes, I know, but Anne's only seven years old, and you're his niece, his own flesh and blood. You'll see. He's left practically all of it to you. Yes. I, I hope you're right, Derek. What's the matter? I, I know we've been thinking about this for a long time, Derek, but, but the doctors did say that Uncle James doesn't have long to live. Couldn't we? No. Could... We've been waiting a year now, and his luck's still holding. We might go on waiting for another ten. You don't want that, do you? No, but... We want that money now, Elaine. Now, when we're young enough to enjoy it. Oh, Derek. Are, are you sure nothing can go wrong? There isn't a chance in the world for anything to go wrong. Unless you slipped up somewhere today. Oh, I did everything you told me to. Only... Only what? Oh, I don't know. Ah, oh, you're just nervous. Perot's coming down, isn't he? Yes. Then that means he's fooled. I've got everything all set. You know what you have to do when you get back to the house, huh? I know, I know. I've been through it a million times. That's it, girl. <laughs> when Monsieur Perot arrives to stop me from killing you, we'll make him an accessory to another murder. <laughs> Yeah, buddy. The shepherd joint. A thousand thanks. Okay, but it's all the same to you. I'd rather have one tip. And that, too. Oh, Monsieur Paulo, come in. You don't know how glad I am to see you. Mademoiselle, it is a great pleasure to receive such a hearty welcome. Uh, there's a deep, dark plot behind my welcome. I suspected as much. Yes. You see, tonight is the servants' night out. I didn't want you to run away because you'd have to put up with my cooking. But, mademoiselle, that will be a pleasure if I may help. You? Well, people who have had the pleasure of sampling the cooking artistry of such famous chefs as Escoffier, Oscar, and the immortal Monsieur de Gouy, these people, mademoiselle, say there is yet one greater chef. Who? Hercule Poirot. Oh, then I'm doubly glad to have you. Oh, there's Uncle's phonograph. That means he's awake. Wouldn't you like to go upstairs and meet him? That is, if you don't mind climbing three flights. Well, I should be delighted, but did you not tell me that it would upset him to know that I am in the house? Oh, don't worry about that. I'm going to tell a little white lie. Now, don't you be surprised at anything I might say. On that score, be at ease, mademoiselle. I have come to expect extraordinary things from you. Hello. 
Perot. Mr. Perot, my Uncle James. I've heard of you, Mr. Perot. <laughs> Wait until I turn this phonograph off, and then you can ask me some questions. Questions, monsieur? Uh, sure. And the only reason I can see for a famous detective like you coming to Manhattan is that you suspect me of murdering someone. All right. Fire away. No, 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 no. I assure you, monsieur, my visit has no such purpose. And then you are here to find out how I broke the bank at Monte Carlo. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people want to know. <laughs> well, that of a surety I would love to know. But I am certain that that is something beyond my poor powers of discovery, eh? You're just as smart as they say you are, and I like you. So I'll tell you how I did it. I was just lucky as the devil. Now, Uncle, Mr. Poirot really came down because he heard about your roses. He's interested in gardening. Well, of course he is. Any smart man would be. I tell you, Mr. Poirot, the roses are all right. Of course, not as fine as they used to be when I was able to get out and tend to them myself. And now, my greatest pleasure is playing records on this phonograph. And a very fine machine. Mr. Poirot is also a good cook, or uh, so he says. He's going to help me with the dinner. And so I am, mademoiselle. Now, what do we have? Well, there's a duckling. With a sauce bigarade. I insist on it. <laughs> if uh, you know how to make it. But of course. And, and some string beans. But I can take care of those. You just boil water and... No, 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 no. It is a sacrilege. You must not destroy the flavor. They must be steamed gently, mademoiselle. And... <laughs> All right, you win. Come along and show me. I will indeed, mademoiselle. Directly after I have my bath, I will make a sauce bigarade that would make Escoffier himself jealous. Ah, mademoiselle, I thank you for a magnificent dinner. Superb. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. And the sauce bigarade? A masterpiece. I have never prepared it better. <laughs> I, uh... I hope you didn't mind my asking Derek over after dinner. No, I did not mind, but I do not see what you hope to accomplish. I think... I know it's probably silly, but if Derek sees that you're actually here, he'll realize that I'm serious and leave me alone. Well, I shall not threaten him, mademoiselle. Threats are useless. No, it's... it's... Oh, there he is. Oh, no, don't bother. I'll let him in. Elaine, I got your message. I came right over. Does it mean you forget... Who's this? May I present Mr. Hercule Poirot? This is Derek Redfield. Poirot? Well, if you did this to impress me, Elaine, you've certainly succeeded. I've heard of you, Mr. Poirot. And I of you, monsieur. Yes, I know. I can just imagine what Elaine's been telling you. You must think I'm a pretty bad sort of guy, but... Uh, well, uh, you really got me in a spot, Elaine. How about a little drink to sort of help me out, huh? Would you like something, Mr. Poirot? A little sherry or port or something strong? Mm, port will do excellently, mademoiselle. Then if you'll just press that button next to your chair, the maid will bring it. I'm too lazy to move. This one? Mm-hmm. I suppose Elaine has told you how I made a complete fool of myself and scared her half to death, Mr. Perot. But I hope you can realize how it is when a fellow's in love. Uh, Mademoiselle, it has just occurred to me. There is no maid to bring the port unless she oh, has uh, already... Oh, of course. I completely forgot how stupid of me. It's only a little after nine. Servants won't be back until eleven. I'll get it. Hey, what did you ask me over for? To ignore me? I was hoping that maybe we could straighten everything out tonight. I'll tell you exactly why I called you when I come back. Ah, the dance macabre, eh? Monsieur Shepard seems to have a rather morbid taste in music. Look, Mr. Perot, you can ask me any questions you like, but I've got to convince you that I don't mean any harm to Elaine. Tell me, monsieur, you did kill her dog? Well, yes, but... Uh... Here we are. I hope you'll find the port to your liking, Mr. Perot. Elaine, I just admitted that I killed Taffy. But I only did it because I love you. You know, sometimes you want to hurt the person you love. Derek, I asked Mr. Poirot to come down here to show you that I'm serious. When I tell you, I never want to have anything to do with you again. I can never forgive the way you've acted. And if you make any more threats, Mr. Poirot will know how to deal with but, you. But, Elaine, if you'll only listen... I have nothing more to say to you, Derek. Oh. Uncle's turned off the Victrola. What time is it, Mr. Poirot? Well, it is 9.15, mademoiselle. Oh, I'd better run upstairs and see if Uncle wants anything. Good night, Derek. But it lay. I said good night. Mr. Poirot, I'm desperate. Maybe you can understand the way I feel. Would you talk to her and put in a good word for me? I am afraid, monsieur, that I would find it slightly ridiculous for me to plead the suit of a man who terrifies a lady to such a degree that she seeks my services to protect herself from him. But I... <laughs> mademoiselle! Mademoiselle! It's Uncle James. He's fallen out of the window. He's dead. Good morning. What's your name? Eric 
little Frago. And yours, my little one? Your name is funnier than mine. I'm Anne, and Sheppy. Ah, then you are the sister of Mademoiselle Elaine. Oh, no, Elaine's my cousin. Not really, you know, because I'm adopted. Ah, yes, I see. Your father was... You think Daddy will be away long? He told me this morning that he went away. Uh, as to that, I, I I could not say, but... How did your mustache get to grow so long? Daddy has a mustache, but not one like that. Ah, my petite, very few men have. Uh, how long have you been living with your daddy? Oh, a long, long time. But you haven't told me whether your mustache is real. I assure you, my little one, it is real. Just like your hair. Oh, you have to brush your mustache then like I have to with my hair? Oh, yes, indeed. One has to take care of a mustache, you know. Could you show me how you brush it now? I would like to, ma petite, but I have not the time. What is ma petite? Uh, it is French. It, it means my little one. When Daddy comes back, I think I'm going to learn French. Uh, you you love your daddy, eh? I should say so. Are you going to live with us now? Mm, perhaps for a little while. How long? I do not know. It, it depends, you see, my little one. Why? Is it because of the noise last night? Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, didon, uh, do you like fairy tales? Oh, yes. Sometimes I tell them to myself. Go for a walk in the woods and I make them up. Oh, but how that is nice, eh? Uh, perhaps you would tell me one sometime, eh? Oh, no, I'd rather have you tell me one. I like you. Uh, and I like you, my little one. You tell me the story about the Snow Queen. Oh, I lost that is a fairy tale I do not know. But I will tell you another one. Once upon a time, there was a great, big, big forest. And in this forest, there lived a very little girl. Now I've seen everything. <clears throat> uh, Inspector Stevens, do you know Mademoiselle Anne, Anne Shepherd? Oh, hello, little girl. Hello. You were telling me a fairy tale. Yeah, I heard him. Uh, but uh, would you do me a favor and leave me alone with Mr. Farrow for a little while? All right. If he promises to finish the story. I promise. Bye. Don't forget your promise. Hello, Farrow. There doesn't seem to be any trouble about this one. No. The coroner, he has ascertained the cause of death. Uh, no question about that. He died from a fall out of his bedroom window onto those jagged rocks while you and Miss Shepard and Mr. Redfield were down here in this room. Are you quite certain, my friend? As you told me, neither of them left the room. Well, Mademoiselle left to bring some wine, but she did not have sufficient time to run up three flights of stairs. And he was wearing a wristwatch, which was pretty well smashed up. The hands had stopped at 9.15. There was a medicine bottle and a spoon on the floor near the window. Now, what I figure is that he must have felt sick, got up, tried to get the medicine, and he fell out of the French windows. Perhaps. Yeah. What do you mean, perhaps? Me? I have an idea it was no accident. You mean you... Yes, my friend. Murder. What? Murder? A particularly vicious and carefully planned murder. Do you know who did it? I think so. Well, what are we waiting for, Poirot? Let's get going. Ah, 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 ah. Gently, my friend, gently. I think it was murder. I even think I know how it was done. But alas, I could not prove it. The murderers would get clear away in a court of law. And you mean you're going to let them get away with it? No, no, that I will most certainly not allow. But we must annoy them, Stevens. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever heard of annoying murderers. I generally arrest them. I do not like murderers, my friend. And when we arrest these, we will make certain they are not set free. The little gray cells, Stevens. The little gray cells have found a way. What do you mean? Murder breeds murder, my friend. And a murderer always repeats. If he poisons once, he poisons again. If he stabs once, he stabs again. If there is an accident once, there is an accident again. What are you going to do about it? Me? I shall help to create an accident. I am going to telephone a lawyer. <laughs> Now that we are all together, I think that we can proceed with the reading of the will. Uh, as the late Mr. Shepherd's attorney, I am the trustee of the estate. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, James B. Shepherd, being of sound mind and body, do him. Uh, I believe that we can skip all that. Uh, here. Uh, all my property, both real and personal, I leave to my adopted daughter, Anne Mary Shepherd, to be held in trust for her until she attains the age of 21. To my loving niece, Elaine Shepherd, I bequeath the sum of $2,000. Oh, 
Uh, some water, please. It appears Mademoiselle Shepard has fainted. What happened? Will you stop shaking and tell me? Uncle James left everything. Left it all to Ed. What? All of it. I don't believe it. It's true. We were all there. McBride read it to us. But it's impossible. Didn't he even mention you? Yes. He left me $2,000. $2,000. Hmm. That's good. That's very good. What are we going to do with $2,000? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, Derek, it's all gone wrong. I knew it when I knew it. I'm sorry we ever started. We never should have done it. Hey, wait a minute. I think I have an idea. Sure, that's the solution. It's easy. What? If you'd only stop and think, you'd see the way it has to be. Derek, I don't know what you're talking about. Who inherited the money, Elaine? Why, Anne of... Uh... No. No, Derek. I say yes. Oh, Derek, you must listen to me. Remember what you said about planning things? The people who didn't think things out made mistakes. Never mind that. I know what I'm doing. No, no, Derek. We planned something. Thought it all out. Look what happened. Even if we do something, Dan, I still won't get the money. Don't be a fool. You have to get it. You're the only living relative. Now, listen, Elaine. Inspector Stevens has gone back to New York. We're perfectly safe. I won't help you do anything to Anne. What makes you so soft about Anne all of a sudden? A bride who doesn't even belong to your family. Where does she come in for anything? Oh, Derek, I... I'm frightened. I, I won't do this with you. Oh, yes, you will. That's one thing I'm sure of now. We're together, Elaine. Together for life. Don't forget, you were with me on one murder. And you're going to be with me on another. Come in. Mademoiselle, I have come to say goodbye. My train leaves within ten minutes. Oh, yes. This has been so dreadful, I, I hardly know what to say to you. Such a terrible accident. If you'll send me your bill... No, mademoiselle. You owe me nothing. That's very kind of you. Of course, now I, I'm afraid I shall have to get used to economizing. Uh, mademoiselle, before I go, is there anything you would like to tell me? Tell you? Why, no, I, I can't think of anything. You are no longer afraid of Monsieur Redfield? To tell you the truth, I've had so many things to think about. I I haven't even given Derek... Well, he hasn't entered my mind. What are your plans? What? Do you intend to stay on here with Mademoiselle Anne? What? I, I hadn't considered it. I don't know. She is a very charming child. I spoke to her this morning and told her the truth about Monsieur Shepard. She is very sad. I think you should see that she has helped. Oh, I intend to. I, I'll do everything in my power. I am sure you will, Mademoiselle. Au revoir. I'm tired. We have to walk much more, Elaine. Oh, you've got to grow up to be big and strong. Remember, I promised you ice cream. Don't think I'd like it now. Can't we play Indian? I didn't know little girls played Indian. I didn't make it up. Roy taught me. No, Roy, Uncle Jerry. No. Do so. He's a boy lives in a big house down the road. See, this is the way we play. I ran away and hide. Anne. Anne. Blast that brat. We'll frighten her. Anne. Anne, dear. Come back. Where did she go? Here I am. See, I'm very good at it. Sometimes even Roy can't find him. He's a scout. Anne, I don't want you to do that again. Yes, you might get hurt. There might be some bad men in the woods. Oh, pooh. Come here, Anne. But you're so near the edge. I said come here. No, I don't want to. Anne, did you hear me? Yes, but I don't like you. I'm going to run away and hide. You're not going to run anywhere. <laughs> there, I've got you. <laughs> oh, Mr. Perot. Mr. Perot. So you didn't take the train. As you see. <laughs> I'm afraid that woods and flowers do not agree with me. I must have the fever of the hay. Cut it off. Pardon. That means stop trying to fool us. You're a little cleverer than I thought. A little? Oh, monsieur, for the sake of courtesy, let us say a great deal, eh? Come here, Anne. Go! Oh, 
Just how clever are you, Perot? Hold oh, still, Anne. Ah, monsieur, really. Such a transparent little plan, eh? You send a charming young lady to my apartment with a very sad tale. She is so distrait. I must protect her from this terrible fiancé. And everything prepared for me, even to the poisoned meat. This meat so strongly dosed and evil smelling that not even a starving dog would have eaten it, monsieur. So I say to myself, these people must have a reason for wishing Hercule Poirot at Manhattan. What is it? And that evening I find out. You have murdered Monsieur Shepard. I told you. I told you. Shut up, you fool. Is that all you have to say, Perot? And you, mademoiselle, the window shade. Did you really believe that such an old, old trick would deceive Hercule Poirot? You become hysterical and you need light. Oh, mademoiselle, you asked me to raise the shade and then the so convenient telephone call. So what? You can't prove we murdered anyone. We were right there with you when Shepard died. Ah, no, monsieur. Monsieur Shepard did not die at 9.15. You killed him earlier, much earlier, before dinner, in fact, while I was bathing. That is the only possible time. It is easy to set the hands of his watch. Then you came over and played your little comedy with me. Oh, you're crazy. You heard him playing his Victrola as well as we did. I heard the Victrola, monsieur. Then if he was dead, who started it? That, monsieur, is what makes me to burn. I started it myself. When Mademoiselle Elaine asked me to press the button for the servants, after making so much bother about their being out, you simply had the wire set for that button to start the record automatically in Monsieur Shepard's bedroom. That was supposed to prove he was alive. You removed the wires last night. All right. You have it all figured out. But you've overlooked one thing. I think not. It is not Hercule Poirot who makes mistakes. But you made one this time. This is the last bit of detecting you'll ever do because you're going over the cliff. Uh, no, Derek, no. Here, hold the kid for me. Monsieur, you are even more stupid than I thought. Yeah, this is perfect. Everyone knows the kid liked you. You went walking together and fell over the cliff. Those shoes of yours weren't made for the country. Another accident. I think not. Give me the chance, mademoiselle. This is it. All right, Inspector. I believe you've had enough. There we are, Redfield. You haven't a chance. Why, oh, you little smart Alec. You'd never have proved a thing if the will hadn't left all that money to that brat. You couldn't have proved it. Precisely, monsieur. That is why I induced the lawyer to read a false will. The real one left everything to Mademoiselle Elaine. to listen again at the same time next week when Agatha Christie, America's favorite mystery writer, brings you her favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, starring Harold Huber in The Book and the Corpse. Agatha Christie's Poirot is directed by Carl Eastman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.